Good morning, brothers and sisters. Baptism, you know, is like washing your sins away. Washing the all the impurities that you had. And to repent for your sins. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the same, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. First Peter, chapter 3, verse 20 through 22. Who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built? In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers and submission to him. Thank you, Joy. Good morning, church. If you're visiting with us today, it is an absolute honor to have you here. All right, let's get our Bibles out and let's say this together, all right? This is my Bible. It contains God's will for my life. I can become what it says I can become. Today, I will study from his word. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll never again be the same. I pray to God that that's true every day time we read his word. The <clears throat> what I want to share with you today came about as a result of a discussion. Had something else and it's simmering on the back burner. I, I want you to think about this. What does it mean? What's the significance? What does it say? Joy just read for us a very significant part, and that is that baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. And that is precious between us and God, but there's more that baptism says than that. You know, sometimes when I'm thinking about a lesson, I get on and I'll start Googling stuff. And I, I usually have to stop because curiosity will just take me everywhere. But as I was thinking about the lesson this week and related to baptism, I got on and I looked at some things, and these are just some things that I saw. One said, I'm a relatively new believer. I was saved through a very faithful Bible preaching ministry on the college campus. I have since graduated, and I'm now looking for a home church to become a member. In every case, I have been asked if I've been baptized. I have not. I need to, and I plan to. But I was wondering if you could explain to me, a new believer, a new believer like me, why, why I need to be baptized. What does it mean? I love the heart of this individual. <laughs> Then I read another one said, baptism doesn't save you. Your guilt before God is removed the moment you trust in Christ. It's the next step after salvation. As a church, we practice baptism by immersion and we baptize saved believers. We understand that baptism doesn't save a person from their sins. 
I, I have no anger, no angst in my body about this, except to say it's, it always surprises me how you can read, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and then someone say that baptism has nothing to do with sin. There's another interesting one. It said baptism is a response to the gospel. Baptism is immersion. Baptism is available to anyone who believes. Baptism is about faith. Baptism is a priority. But it doesn't say anything about sin. Now, I don't know where to just wade out in this except to say that this life and death matter of baptism. And it is a matter of life and death. Now, yes, it's the final step in a process of, of believing, hearing the message about Jesus, and believing who Jesus is, and being willing to repent of my sins, changing the direction of my life. But this pushback, this denial of forgiveness of sin is a fairly modern thing. By modern, I mean it's just a few centuries old. Somewhere in the late 18th century, the 19th century, and it's sort of solidified by the middle of the 20th century, the idea that ah, baptism is just sort of optional. All four go Gospels give an account of John the Baptist. I find it interesting, you, you know, you get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who are called synoptic gospels because you can sort of put them parallel and see. But John writes a lot of things that are different than those three and for a good reason, and he explains it in his book. But I found it interesting that even the gospel of John talks about John the Baptist. We don't have time to read it all this morning, but I'll, I'll just jump in and, and look at a few things. John the Baptist's ministry and he was the one who was to come before Christ, was about repentance and baptism. This was the central focus of John's message. John came baptizing, it said, beyond Bethany in the Jordan River. In fact, Mark says, so John came baptizing in the desert region, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Listen to this, the whole Judean countryside and all the people for Jerusalem went out to him confessing their sins and were baptized by him in the Jordan River. I wish I had taken the time to do this and put it on a map, but it's, it's a long walk from Jerusalem and most parts of Judea out to where John the Baptist was baptizing people. By the way, you probably wouldn't have chosen John the Baptist, right? His three-piece suit of camel hair and, you know, his diet of, of locusts and wild honey probably wouldn't have, eh, we'd have probably rejected him for that. Anyway, Luke says this. By the way, I love Luke. Luke is our Gentile brother. He said, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Listen to this. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. What should we do, the crowd asked. John answered, well, the man with two, tin, two, with two tunics should share. The one who has none and the one who has food should do the same. Uh, here's the IRS agents, the ugly people. They came to be baptized and they said, teacher, what shall we do? And he said, what? Don't collect more than you required. Verse 14, then some soldiers asked him, well, what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. The bottom line to all of them, be content with what you have. The people were waiting expectantly and all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize with water, but one more powerful than I come will come. The thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. John writes, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. He's out in the, the river still baptizing people. And he said, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. 
This is the one I meant when I said, a man must come after me to surpass me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. John's purpose foretold in the Old Testament and fulfilled was to come and make it easier for Jesus as he begins to proclaim something that the world has never heard. John's going to talk about baptism. He's going to talk about repentance. It's been 400 years since they've heard of anything. So here's what John said. Pre -pre 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 <laughs> he preached repentance from sin. He preached confession of sin. He baptized for sin. He said, the one, one coming later is greater than I am. And he came so that Jesus might be revealed. Now, John introduces baptism then to the nation of Israel. Now, there were some things under the old covenant that could have probably fallen into this area of baptism, but they most often referred to them as washings. But John is going to come and talk about repentance and baptism, something that has never before been heard of or discussed in the land of Israel. On the day of Pentecost, when the church begins and Peter stands up and preaches the first sermon, would you have chosen Peter? <laughs> I just have to, I'm sorry, I just sometimes wonder, would you have chosen Peter? Well, what, what did Peter just do? Few, few. He denied him three times. He swore with an oath, you know, on the temple or something. I don't know the man. And then it says he looked up and looked in the eyes of Jesus. But Peter on the day of Pentecost preaches this sermon. It's amazing. I love to read it. And then he gets down to the end and shows the significance of baptism in the life of people for the very first time time. Now, I want you to drive a peg right there and hang on to that. Because as I got to working on this lesson, I decided I can't do this in one week. Well, I could, but you'd be leaving, you know. And so let's, let's break it up a little bit, all right? So drive a peg right there and hang on to that about John the Baptist, because we're going to come back to that. I want us to think this morning a, a little bit, and we're going to shift gears a little bit, about the fact that baptism involves one witnessing that Jesus is Lord. You cannot baptize someone. Someone cannot be immersed into Christ without them saying the fact that Jesus is Lord. They may not proclaim it at that moment, but the baptism itself is such a proclamation. Today, if you say Jesus is Lord, <laughs> nobody will get excited. Nobody will raise an eyebrow. In fact, they probably will just ignore you. But that's not how it always was. In the Jewish and Roman world, the act of baptism is so far different from our perspective as a 21st century Gentile. Stay with me. As the gospel were preached and people were baptized, what was taking place? Remember in Acts 10, Cornelius? I mean, it took a lot to get Peter to go over and have a conversation with him. But when he did, and the end of the result that day is amazing. They we're all defying Caesar's creeds, as it was we'll say, say later to Paul, saying that there's another king, one called Jesus. Paul's accused of that by a mob, and he's right. He is saying there's another king. There is one greater, the greatest king that's ever lived, Jesus. Now, when Peter preached to Jesus, a Roman centurion had already taken an oath, right? He'd taken an oath saying, Caesar is Lord that was required. 
So Cornelius, he preaches to him, and then at the end of it, it says this. He ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. I never thought about that that much until I got to thinking about it this week, the significance. I've, I've always understood that the preaching to Cornelius was the including was including now the Gentiles into the family of God. We need to really grasp that baptism was an act that absolutely defied the entire world. Still does. But baptism was really a rebellion. Think about the Jewish world. All right. Some of them said, the apostles and others, the disciples, believers in Jesus said, all right, he's already come. They shouldn't, don't waste your time looking for another. However, there were other leaders in the Jewish movement who said, no, nah, it's not so. He's not come. To the Roman world, if you said Jesus is Lord and not the emperor, what's the result? Blasphemy. Treason. And that's what in Acts 17, 7, they're accusing Paul of treason. See, they couldn't get him on any, any religious grounds that was worth any while. So like people in our today, they just attack something else. All right. Stephen was stoned for his faith. What is his last memory? He looks up and sees heaven open and he sees his Lord. Tacitus, a Roman historian and politic, a politician, reports the first empire-wide persecution began under Nero. Tacitus, we have still, some of his, a couple of his works are still available. He wrote during three emperor time, the times of three emperors. But the empire persecution that Nero started was nothing compared to the persecution of Domitian, which would last the next two centuries. North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Pakistan, Yemen, Iran, and Egypt. They say somewhere around 10 to 15 people die every day, according to Open Doors World Watch, because they confess Jesus, Egypt being the worst offender. So we don't, maybe we don't understand the significance. Maybe we don't understand how important, how, re, how much of a rebellion that says. You go to a country like Iran or Yemen, or there's another one or two that I left off. If you have anything in your suitcases or your luggage that reminds them of something of Christianity, you're in trouble. Baptism is about personal obedience, but baptism is way more than just personal obedience. It was subversive. It said to the dominion of the world, no. Think about it. The God of this age is blind to the minds of unbelievers so they can't see the light of the gospel that, that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So every time someone is baptized, the God of this age hates it. By the way, he's the God of every age. And in the sense of the world. Baptism was the public signal. It was the moment to the crowd that the believer had definitely broken off any relationship. Now, I realize like most decisions made, it will take time to fully implement that. But it is a moment in time in which they say, I'm done with the world. Jesus is my Lord. That's true now, it's true. Truth is true now. You think about the kingdoms of the world. 
They're sustained by cunning, by slimy immoral agreements, by power, by greed. Just look around. That's one side of the world. On the other side is Jesus and his kingdom and everyone else. And it's never been different than that. What made Jesus Lord? You know, the fact that someone confessed him or acknowledged didn't make it Lord, didn't make him Lord. They're only acknowledging the fact that he is Lord. God made Jesus both Lord and Christ. Huge. When Peter preaches this on the day of Pentecost, and the Roman leaders are, and the Jewish leaders are there around. They feel intimidated. They, they feel like someone is, is usurping them. And he was. It was God who made Jesus Lord. They weren't saying, you know, Jesus is Lord, story him up in your heart. They said, Jesus is Lord, end of story. Jesus is Lord, we're done. Jesus is Lord, there's no more to say. So when we think about baptism, who controls baptism? Marion Webster says baptism is the sacrament of admission to the church, symbolized by the pouring or sprinkling of water on the head by immersion or by immersion in water. Thank you. Baptism doesn't belong to an individual. Not even the church. You see, that would take away from the richness of what baptism is. Baptism is not for various denominations to take an altar and tweak and twist it until it becomes something that they like. Do we sprinkle? Do we pour water over someone's head? Joy, come up here a second. Joy offered to help me demo this. Take this quarter, put it in the water, all the way under. Now pick it out. Thank you. Joy just baptized a quarter. He did. That's what the word means. It means to take and cover in water. I better take it out of there. This may be cheap. It might just rust. I want to do something simple enough that we could understand. When you took a cup and you submerged it totally underwater, you just baptized that cup. It was a word that was in existence before Jesus chose it and used it as part of the plan of salvation. Do we sprinkle? Do we pour? Does it matter? Well, suppose I took that quarter and I just sprinkled a little bit on it. Have I baptized it? If I poured a little bit on it, have I baptized it? The word, the word means to immerse. That's why in Romans chapter 6, when he talks about baptism, he says it is a burial. What did I do with my clicker? There we go. Ephesians 4 says this, there is one body, one spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's no twosies in there, there's no threesies in there. There is one Lord, Jesus. One baptism, immersion by water into a relationship with Christ. Yes, all preceded by faith, by repentance, by confession. The only, there's only one baptism that the New Testament is aware of. I'm speaking of the New Testament, which we talked about really begins in the book of Acts. Remember, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is still alive and he's living under the old covenant. 
But you start with the book of Acts and you move forward. There's only one baptism that's understood. It is an act uh, uh, in which one declares the reign of God in Jesus is superior to the other kingdoms of the world. And that is a declaration that is made. I never thought about, I, ha I never thought about when I was baptized that I made a declaration. I never thought about the significance of what baptism was to me. I got the sin part, and that's really, 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 really important. Today, whenever the gospel is preached or taught or whatever, the kingdoms of the world are being put on notice. I read of a man who, in fact, I know of a had a friend, we made trips to Russia. He's gone on to be with the Lord. But he actually went over into Egypt and baptized people of a night in the pools. I read a, about a man who, this long happened ago, a decade ago, but he, he wanted to be baptized and who's he gonna ask? So a man flew all the way from England to Egypt, baptized him into Christ and went home. We take this for granted. When I was in Russia, I've seen people come on a, a, a train that would take 18 or 30 hours to get to someone who could fully explain to them what they wanted to know about baptism and to be baptized into Christ. So it doesn't matter if you're from a developed nation or an undeveloped nation. It doesn't matter if you have big armies or no army. It doesn't matter if you're dazzled by all the, you know, the things in the world. Baptism is still what it is. Whenever people in faith take on the name of Jesus, baptize, bab, those who are baptized are defying the world and saying, Jesus is Lord. And I will never watch a baptism again that I don't remember the significance of that fact. In the book of Acts, baptism is the definitive moment when the believer says to the world, I'm gone. It is a moment in time. It's, 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 it's the beginning. I get it. How much does a baby need to know to be born? Not a lot. How much do you need to know? You need to believe that Jesus is the Christ. You need to be willing to change your life. I'm not saying you are a rapist or a thug, but you are not going in the direction of Jesus. You are not honoring him as Lord. You need to confess him. You need to be buried with him in baptism for the forgiveness of sin. Are you ready to proclaim Jesus as Lord to the world? If you are, we'll help you. If you're not and you're uncertain, we'll share with you and let you know the significance that Jesus has had in our life. We're going to stand and sing a song. If we can encourage you, let us know.